but I was all of a sudden, I was the Walter Gropius of the banjo. And it turns out he was like a great architect of some sort. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right. Welcome back to the Exploring Washington State podcast. I am your host, Scott Cowan. The only reason I'm telling you my name is because my guest name today is Scott Adams. So Scott will always be speaking just the way the episode's going to go, right? <laughs> so Scott, you are a Seattle area musician that was introduced to us by former guest Toby Hansen. Let's start with that question. How, how do you know Toby? I met Toby, so um, I went to music school beginning in, I guess it was about January of 1997, uh, Cornish College of the Arts here in Seattle, and I went to an orientation the day before classes started, and there were like 10 people there, and Toby was one of them, and he was like a kind of a guide, he was a, he was a mentor, uh -huh. and it's like, oh, you're in the music department, oh, you too, blah -dee blah and um we just got along really well because neither of us exactly fit the, the, you know, the stereotype and the, you know, the exactly this, he was an accordion player studying music composition. And I was a guitar player studying music composition who couldn't read music at that point. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, well, or I was, we... you know, I was just barely baby stepping it, but I was a rock musician, but I wanted okay. to, I wanted to grow. So that's why I was there. I, I I can't imagine the school had a lot of accordion players. I, you know, I just, it just, I, that's an interesting instrument to me. It's uh it's an interesting instrument. So yeah, you and you and <laughs> you and Toby met and uh, all these years later, you're still, you're still in contact. When we had talked on the phone, you had mentioned you have played in the past and do play occasionally with, with him in his band or. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. His band, the Smiling Scandinavians. Um, I, I ran with that first year. I knew him within a couple months. Actually, I ran sound for them a couple of times, and then by that summer, six months later, I had played my first gig with them as a you know as a sub on the guitar, and then he he facilitated me buying a banjo. Uh, so then I became like you know like a banjo player in his band and I played frequently like there was one other guy that we would and we would kind of trade gigs back and forth and uh so yeah I played I ended up playing with the, with that band like overall seven or eight years maybe played on a couple of records and and really had had a good time until it was just yeah. it's like you know time I was I was a music teacher d during the day and then and then the weekends would be taken up by traveling for this band because he was gigging a lot and i just burned out after a while sure now i didn't know that adams was a scandinavian scandinavian last name so did <laughs> you did you have a moniker i you know i i i can't imagine that everybody in the in the band was scandinavian so i'm, I'm just wondering if you guys ever you know the only name that comes to mind is sven so i i don't know I'm yeah just, uh... <laughs> that was actually a good basis for shtick in that band like like the original, when I was first hanging out with them and learning about the band and seeing them and all that, they had a uh, a saxophone player named Ian Lucero, who is, I believe, Filipino. Yeah, so, that's so Scandinavian. There were there were some great there was some great uh, like little stock stage jokes that Toby would have, mm. and um, he didn't he didn't go so much into my ethnic heritage as much as. You know, he would he would make up a thing like the Mike Wolf was the tuba player and Mike Wolf was the two time Washington State tuba champion, which was true. Okay. And, and then I was um, the Walter Gropius of the banjo. That you lost me with that one. What? And, what? and I, I, I had to ask myself, but I was all okay. of a sudden I was the Walter Gropius of the banjo. And it turns out he was like a great architect of some sort. And I've forgotten. I. <laughs> But um, it, it was. I thought it was funny, and and nobody else knew what it was either. And that okay. was kind of part of the fun of the joke, I think. So 
All right. Well, enough about Toby. This this episode's about you. <laughs> before before you went, you, you mentioned rock music. So, you, were you playing in bands around Seattle? Are you are you from Seattle originally, or where 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 was where did you where did you start your journey in the world? <laughs> you know, my my journey. If I if you trace it all the way back to my parents' birth, they were both both born there, born in Wenatchee. So I know okay. that I know that that's where you're living now. So I brought that up. Okay. That reason, but I grew up in Spokane. Okay. So what brought did is that when you moved to Seattle was to go to Cornish or had you moved Actually, over before that? I moved over before. Um, I, I went to Washington State right out of high school. Okay. And got a degree in psychology. And then that I finished in 1991, moved over here to okay. Seattle. And, um, but I, I grew up playing, yeah, music in Spokane and then, oh. and then Pullman. Well, okay. So did you ever, I'm going to guess, not that we talk about other states, but did you ever play in Moscow? I mean, did you make that, that deadly journey between Pullman and Moscow? Yes. <laughs> and actually one of my best Horrible Hopefully there's not a bad story there for you. So there is a bad story, not oh. about the driving, not about any kind of, okay. Uh, but just playing a gig. Can I share my bad gig story from Moscow, yeah. Idaho? Yeah. Is, let's is hear it, it too early in the morning for no, that. No, it's, um, no. Well, who knows when people are listening to this? It's, it's perfectly okay. <laughs> right. So we got it. We, we had this band. It was a, we were a trio and we were playing original tunes and they okay. were kind of, um, you know, um, college rock kind of we were inspired by dinosaur jr and whole bunch of cool bands of that era you okay. know that we really liked and but it was our own kind of poppy and original music anyway we got a gig opening for like a really great cover band who were friends of ours i think it was the heebie-jeebies they were called um okay. and cover band really popular around the area a bar in idaho and we thought, cool, we'll we'll play this opening gig and stuff. And I just remember, I think we um, we we played our first song and no one recognized it. And you know, and people were just kind of like, you know, just very. It was it was pretty crickety as far as the response. And somebody yells out, "Hey, Jesus!" And I guess that was for me because I had long hair at the time. <laughs> and and. And it was just that got a laugh and whatever. And we kept playing and we knew that it wasn't going well. And then during maybe the third or fourth song, the drummer, like there was there was there was an elevated stage and he not only fell off his stool, he fell off the stage entirely. And all of a sudden the drums stop and you just hear like, you know, all the, the cymbals, the bass drum gone. But you ever, you hear this one like snare on two and four. He's still, he's still doing it, but you can only see his hand reaching up from off the stage because <laughs> he is on the floor. Please tell me the crowd responded in a, in an enthusiastic <laughs> manner to, to that. I mean, I think actually that's probably the best response we got of the night. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring this up. So this is a question I've, I've never really asked anybody. So What's it like when you're having a bad gig? How do you keep soldiering on? Oh, it just sucks. Um, <laughs> and we move right on from that. Yeah, yeah. But but I, I mean, I think it, it, you get better with experience. I okay. Think, you know, you're just like, oh, okay, this is one of those. And I know that, I know that this is not the summation of what my life is or was or will be okay. about. I know that this is just one of those gigs and going to just, you know, get through it and then have a drink on the other side and, <laughs> and hopefully just, yeah, just get home as soon as possible or get out of here as soon as possible. Cause I'm right. you're yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I was always, you know, I kind of wonder about that. Cause you know, you, it sounds like if the heebie jeebies were a cover act, so people were there to hear, you know, contemporary yeah. music of the day, if you will. Yeah. And you, you show up playing something that they didn't recognize. And you're not the heebie-jeebies. Yeah. And it's in Moscow, Idaho. Come on. Um. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And Moscow is still. So I was in Pullman, like the, I think I'm the last year where they carried the, the grandfather, the grandfather clause such that you could drink at 19 in Idaho mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. crossing the border. Right. And then they changed that to, they changed their drinking age to 21 right after that. Right. Um, yeah, I'm uh, 
I, I, I had friends that went to, uh, to WSU and I went to central and we'd drive over and see him every now and then. And, um, I'm not a big fan of Pullman. I, I'm afraid to say that because somebody will get mad at me for saying that. I, <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not. It, and it's not not the university. I've got go Cougs. I went to Central. I can say go Cougs or go Huskies. No one can get mad at me. But I don't have the best stories about Pullman, Washington. Let's just put it that way. That yeah. that, that town and I. Yeah, we well, let's let's move on. Um, yeah. <laughs> So you moved to Seattle. You, you got out of uh, out of Pullman. You graduated from WSU and you moved to Seattle. What were you? So you started playing. So the reason the reason I'm asking this is like I think I told you the other day on the phone. I'm a member of a Facebook group and there was this poster or this picture, handbill maybe, <laughs> of and it said you know I can't remember the I should have saved it and I didn't. And I tried to find it before we went live. And I couldn't. But your name popped up. Yeah. And they called you a nickname and I can't remember. And I'm really mad because it was a, I thought it was a funny nickname and I wanted to just like slide it into the conversation somehow, but I, I just, can, I can probably fill in all the gaps in that. Just oh, because, then let's fill them in because, so what was yeah. the name of the band that you were playing in back then? So that was baby. So high baby. So high. Okay. And that That's was an interesting name. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was a fun name and it, cause it kind of, I think it was some sort of, they were, they were toys of some sort in the seventies. I'm sure you can Google it and okay. our band won't come up, I'm sure, but the toys yeah. will, um, and our singer knew about these and I think they were relatively obscure toys of some sort. And maybe there were different kind of characters of okay. toys, but I, I don't remember exactly, but our singer came up with that and he was, so it was interesting because these were my best buds, you know, and we, we, I'd been in a band the year before and a couple people graduated. So it's like, oh, let's start a new band this year with these guys. And it's like, oh, yeah, let's start a band because we're all excited about the same thing at the same time. Or so we think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the singer's basically he's really into stuff like the Ramones. OK. And, you know, like uh, and but there was some crossover. We liked some of the same bands like all oh, the, the Descendants and some some of the cool poppy punk stuff of the day. Okay. Okay. And then, but I was like really into like all that stuff, but also really into like stuff like Rush. So I got, I got an amplifier that sounded kind of like Alex Lifeson. It, it was a, it had this chorusy sound, but I okay. still had a distortion pedal and all that. And, uh, and the singer just hated, and the, the bass player, I, I got the bass player kind of into what I was doing too. So mm -hmm. it was just getting more and more kind of proggy but okay. still punk and the singer just wanted like three chords in the truth, you know, <laughs> which I, I respect a lot more now than I did then, but okay. I was a musician and I wanted to play a lot of notes and a, a young, sure. a young undisciplined musician at that. So okay, that's kind of how it went. Um, the nickname would have been probably fluffy. Yeah. That sounds about what I was remembering. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. And it just, because the, 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 at the time, in the group of friends, it was about making fun of each other. Right. And and typical of, of, of men of that age. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and um, a nickname didn't work unless you hated it. If you if you were disgusted by it and everyone else thought it was funny, you were sunk. Yep. Yep. And so that's how I got that nickname and making fun of making fun of each other and making fun of glam, glam rock, things like mm -hmm. Motley Crue Poison. Mm -hmm. That was just like stock stuff. The hair to make bands fun of, of the day. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that was kind of how that happened. Yeah, kind of happened. So anyway, it was it was just kind of funny because I'm I'm in this Facebook group and it's like it just your name, you know, yeah. you know, you know, you know the, the doom scrolling that you do on Facebook. You know, whoa, how did um, I end up here? Yeah, yeah, how did I end up here? It was just like <laughs> this. This stopped me. Okay. <laughs> So you were doing the rock scene in Seattle, but then you decided you wanted to learn, you get into music composition. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm going to use your words against you. You just said you were a young musician who liked to play a lot of notes. Um, so is that what kind of was the impetus to, to go this route or what was the, you know? Yeah, for sure. What brought you there? For sure. Well, um, Let's see. Okay. So back to arriving in Seattle kind of got me there. You mm -hmm. know, a few people had planted seeds of why 
you know, getting a music education would be beneficial. But when I first heard those ideas, it was like, I thought that, that learning formal modes of operation would inhibit my creativity because I, I knew every, because I was 20 and I knew everything and I was endlessly creative and full of my own Mm -hmm. whatever, you know? Right. So as, as, as I think we all were. (laughs) Right. And so I moved, I moved to Seattle and actually like grunge hit pretty much the moment I got here. It was like, so it's your fault. It's my fault. Yeah. <laughs> like Nirvana broke kidding. within six months of me moving here. That all okay. happened. And I really was playing acoustic guitar and not playing in bands at, at that time. Okay. And so I was kind of left out of that and by mm-hmm. my own, you know, by my own choice, you know. So I was kind of getting into folk music and okay. still definitely wanted to be a like more and more sophisticated musician. And... Learning, you know, do you remember The Rocket, that publication? I love The Rocket. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm on the hunt. Just let me put it out there. I'm on the hunt for the, there's two covers of The Rocket magazine that I'm looking for. And they both have the the Seattle band, The Heats on them. And that's what I'm looking for. So if any of our listeners have The Rocket magazine with The Heats, call me. Oh, cool. There's there's my sales pitch for this episode. How are you going to go? Do you have a connection with The Heats? Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm friends with Steve Pearson. Cool. And, um, uh, that story, uh, we could have a whole episode on the heats, um, cool. and with me. I, I yeah. saw them in Spokane. I'm, I'm, I think they played at the clock tower at Riverfront Park. Probably, I, probably. I would have seen them like maybe 14 or 15 and I dug them like, but they like, I, I don't like your face. Oh God, you picked the one song. Yes, that's that's the one that that's the popular that's, song. Yeah, that's the popular. That's the one that hit the top forty and yep. that uh, probably um, doomed them. Yeah, um, probably. But no, they were. Yeah, they were a great band. I saw them, first time I saw them was in nineteen eighty at Central Washington University. I had no idea who they were. Uh, they were playing outside in front of one of the dormitories, and uh, yeah. Um, 40 plus years later, I still listen to their music that's very cool. regularly. That's cool. I should look them yeah. up. I, yeah, I connected with them. I mean, they, I don't know if this is a good comparison or not, but I was, I was really into cheap trick at the time. And, First concert I ever saw was cheap trick. Oh, cool. They're a great band. They're yeah. A great band. Cool. And I, they, I mean, they just instantly resonated with me because yeah. it was like, Oh, that this is what I like. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, good, good, good craftsmanship with a with a nice sense of humor in their uh, in their lyrics. Uh, always, Rick Nielsen was always entertaining to watch on stage. Yes. Um, yeah. No. Oh, I okay. All right. Actually, so, a whole bunch of what drove me toward songwriting because I, you know, for a while I was, you know, we were kind of writing our songs together, but I never really was into. It's like, oh, even without my buddies around, I want to write songs, and a okay. lot of that impetus was like rick nielsen it's like who's that you know who's the name the name that's on the label under all these songs right you know right. and sometimes robin zander's there too but it's rick nielsen it's rick like nielsen. he's the writer so i had mm-hmm. I, yeah i instantly mm-hmm. identified with and i was a nerdy kid too so i was just like he's kind of you know there were the, the, the beautiful the beautiful guys and yep. then the two the nerdy the, guys in that band. The, yeah, that was that was kind of half the fun of the band though. They had the two you know the two rock stars. Yeah, and then and then the two AV club guys. Exactly. And, <laughs> I knew and, who I was. <laughs> yeah, and and they were they were fun live. I I got a kick out of I read a story and this you know pre internet so one of the things that I I read about them was all through Illinois and Indiana. They would. They had the. You know, remember the poster that was, or the the stickers that were cheap trick, cheap trick, cheap cheap trick, just in the you know black yeah. with white. In that font, they would yeah. post them everywhere, so people would, and people, would, what what is this? And they, so they were out guerrilla marketing in the seventies, uh, you know, just blasting their name anywhere. I mean, any truck stop, any bathroom stall, they were just plastering garbage cans. Yes, and that was their. You know, that's how they got started. And I just thought, oh, that's kind of you know. DIY. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. yeah D- DIY. And just before, because now, you know, you post something on, you know, TikTok and you're famous in 30 seconds because isn't that the way it works for everybody? Um, 
course. But, <laughs> anyway, but we're we're as I warned you, welcome to the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, so it's a good one though. So you so you were writing, you were playing acoustic guitar, um, not actively in a band. Seattle's music scene had the spotlight turned on it pretty heavy at that time. Yeah, and you were not an active participant in that in that in that spotlight which is fine not right away and but i did okay. like through you know i made a demo like i buddy i borrowed my buddy ian's uh basically was an eight track cassette recorder mm -hmm. and i made a demo and i played it for a few friends and one of them um julie julie green who i had been to, she went to high school with me and then we also were at wazoo at the same time so i i kind of known her for a long time mm -hmm. uh i played it for her and she just started singing harmonies like right off the right off the bat like that were okay. just brilliant and mm -hmm. we started doing gigs together we played a gig at the off ramp in probably 1994 okay. um and then just kept going as a band and we were called the service berries and it was kind of a folk duo and then later on trio my friend randy joined and then her her little sister Anjanette joined okay um and we were doing you know just these harmonies and weird original music but that was funny. Like we mm -hmm. had, we had some naughty songs that were still funny and okay. she would do a big fake orgasm in one of them and rest in peace, Julie Green, cause she passed away a few years ago. Um, okay. But we had a really fun thing going and that was, you know, through 95 or so. Okay. And then I got the opportunity to travel. Like I, I, you know, I was, I went to Europe a couple of times just, as a, as a tourist, you know, mm -hmm. and then a teaching gig came up in Korea right after I got back from one of those trips. And I was just like, yes, because I was working in a warehouse and it was just oh, okay. dismal. And, uh, so I taught English in Korea and I really, you know, it's still all the time, just like, what am I going to do with my life? Because I didn't use that psych degree. Mm -hmm. Um, did you, did you ever participate in squid game while you're there? <laughs> you know what? I just saw the first episode of that last night. Oh my God. That, <laughs> Sorry. I had heard people talking about it and I was like, what is that? But you know, I didn't. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't watch all of it. I, I had to stop about halfway through. I just like, I can't do this. Wow. Like through yeah. the whole season or through just the first episode. First season. Yeah. I got through the first episode. I was like, <laughs> yeah not my not my thing but anyway it's, sorry that was bad yeah it's brutal um but anyway yeah um i i taught english in korea and it was completely exotic and crazy experience and i loved it but while i was there i had a lot of time by myself because the, you know the, the conversations were basically like hello mr scott hello how are you today i'm fine would you like to eat something Yes, I would like some rice. Um, and that's about as far as the, any of the conversations got. And I, I'll leave out the accent that I usually use to do that because that doesn't seem very kosher to do that. But it's but. it's not, it's just, it's the, it was the pacing that you just gave. Yeah. Hello, and the, and the, it's just the, the depth, that very, yeah. The depth of content was, was just really like that. Cause that was, I mean, it was that my limitation in their language. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I knew how to, by the end, I could get a cab to the airport. And I could order food and I could find where I, they could, I could get them to point me to where the bathroom was. Okay. And simple right, greetings, well. which was fun. Um, right. So you, you did that and then you came back. Yeah. And I had some time to think while I was there. So in, it popped into my mind. It's like, oh, finally I could justify going to music school because I can teach English. If I can teach English with no preparation or experience teaching anything, I can fall back on teaching music. So that's how I can justify going to music school. Okay. Cause I felt like I needed to justify it. Cause otherwise I would just be d accumulating another degree that I wouldn't use or couldn't use. Okay. So with that in mind, I started applying to schools. Okay. And came back, went to, went to Cornish, you know, passed the audition with a, so uh, help me out here. So Cornish is music school and you didn't, read music at that time not really not okay. really was that part of the audition luckily no okay and right. it, since i was if if i would have been 
applying as an instrumentalist, I'm sure I would have had to do some sight reading and okay. probably and play some repertoire. But as it was, I was I was applying as a composer. I showed up with a cassette tape and played some of my, you know, I like prepare I played a couple I have a couple prepared guitar tunes. If mm-hmm. and if audience uh, members don't know what prepared guitar is it's basically where you, you you take a guitar and maybe you attach things to the strings so that they have a different sound. Mm-hmm. So basically, you can a- attach like alligator clips to guitar strings and make it sound kind of like little gongs. It's weird because mm. they just resonate differently. Okay. Um, and I had a, a like a garbage bag tie, one of these big plastic things that I wove <laughs> between the strings. It gives it kind of a cool muted tone. And one of my okay. uh, one of my compositions was just all about prepared guitar stuff. Anyway, the the head of the department listened. Well, I think part of it, what helped me get in was that he didn't he didn't understand how to set up the stereo system so that it would play the cassette. So I figured that out, and he figured, oh well, he's one of those guys. He's he's smart enough to to be here. Maybe like the AV club strikes again. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> all yeah. right. All right. All right. So did you enjoy your time at Cornish? I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I in, met so many great people and okay. loved my teachers. Put you on the spot. What was your biggest takeaway from Cornish? Um, wow, that's a great question. Well, just the, the whole immersion of being in, envi- in an environment Mm-hmm. Where that was my my sole focus is just to grow, learn and grow. Okay. So I don't know if this is answering the question really, but I did. I just immersed myself. I like I kind of said yes to everything. Okay. Um. I you know it's like oh play play in the gamelan. Oh, you know write a piece for you know electronic instruments. Yes. Uh. Write mm-hmm. a full orchestra piece that you'll get to hear. Yes. You know, okay. all these all right. kind of things that I got to do, string quartets. Um, it was mostly in the classical department, but I got to write a big band jazz tune um, and get all, you know, all these things I got to hear. And I got cassettes of them, you know, later dats and then uh, CDs and they're in my garage, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So what did you, so you're mostly in the classical department, but. What was it like hearing your, your composition? God, you know, amazing. I mean, amazing. Yeah. So you didn't like, you know, so like some of us hate to hear the sound of our voice. So when we like, I don't listen to these episodes when we're done. Cause they're like, ah, right. so I don't know for me, I'd be kind of me personally. I'd be kind of, I don't know. So wasn't it, I would have thought it'd been weird to, to do something out of like my genre. Like you were into, we'll call it, you know, punk prog, prog, punk, you know, whatever. All that. You know, yeah. Like, yeah, you know, Rush meets the Ramones. How's that? Um, <laughs> it's probably not a good analogy, but and then you're you're doing something in the classical realm. What was it like writing for instruments that you didn't play? That's a great question. Um, well, I mean, luckily, I'm in a room full of people who are in the same boat. I mean, it's a room full of people who maybe has some have some experience with some of the instruments, but I don't think anyone had really any direct experience with any of those instruments. You know. Okay. Or, yeah. So, I mean, they give you a little preparation. Like, you get a, you know, you have an orchestration book, ideally, um, which gives you, it's like, here's the range of the instrument, um, mm-hmm. you know, the lowest and highest notes that it can play. Here, you know, for violin, you know, here is like what a, what a beginner player is likely to be able to play well and an intermediate player and an advanced player. Okay. So, it gives you an idea of, of how complex or simple to write the pieces and the range what and and whatnot also things like but with a violin um like what's a reasonable so part of what you do when you compose in that in in classical genre you're doing more than just writing out the notes you might be writing out the phrasing for the instruments so and phrasing for like you take a bow one way across a violin right Mm-hmm. And that's that's a phrase because when they need to come back, that needs to be a natural stopping point in the melody, right? 
Uh, you're, he, you're over my head. I'm just nodding along well, politely. You, well, just, okay. Full, so, full disclosure, but that's okay. So let's imagine we're, you're singing. So everyone can relate to singing. <sighs> Same kind of thing. Like, how long of a melody can you sing without having to take a breath? Okay, right. So you want to put breathing points into the melody, or the, otherwise the string players will be confused and they'll mm-hmm. butcher butcher it because they won't know what to do and they'll disagree with each other and you want them to be agreeing. The string section wants to, you want them to agree on okay. when to switch their bow and you'll see them, you know, you watch a, a string section and they're going to like, they're all going this way. They're all going that way. And, and, and they're, you know, they're somewhat, they're following the music and they're also following that, that leader of the string section, the concert master, okay. all these things. Okay. That I didn't know before and that I still I, I'm like rusty on because it's there's there it's a very sophisticated world. Okay. Um but the same with like, you know, the 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 people who play wind instruments are gonna run out of air if if you write the phrase too long. Okay. Um so all these things to consider that you wouldn't have thought of. And then things mm-hmm. like the the conductor would oh the conductor would come into our class and this was really helpful. She'd be like Okay, you have 15 minutes for the orchestra to see your piece of paper and make music out of it. So oh. make it simple. And they she hammered this across, you know, and luckily I was I heard that because Okay. Some okay. of the people in the class didn't get to hear their whole piece because they they wrote something that was either complex, too complex or too confusing. That would have been probably just brilliant had they had like a month to rehearse the piece or whatever. Right. But you get 15 minutes. It's just called a reading. So 15 minutes. So you, you so how much time did it take you to put in to get this piece ready for your 15 minutes of fame? Oh my God. If they had been paying me like for for the piece, I you know, it was it was like 15 cents an hour. Like I I spent hours in my little basement okay. apartment, you know. <laughs> but it was nothing I had nothing else that I was, was important to do in my life you know I had a, a job on the weekends that I would do but other okay. than that that's what that's all I did was stuff okay. like that all right so when you graduated from Cornish what what did you end up doing um I got a part-time gig like teaching well I yeah, I did over the summer I got a gig like doing uh, musical direction for kids theater camps okay which you know it's like i'd work with a theatrical director who also i knew from cornish who was really cool he got me the job okay. and um we wrote our own they had music that we were that they had supplied the people who set up these camps supplied us right. with music and we're like eh, we're gonna write our own music <laughs> so we wrote our own music together that just the two of us he wrote the words and i wrote the music we wrote our own music for robin hood the musical and uh okay. so we did that for a summer for four different camps of two weeks each as i recall decent pay okay. only half the day like i think you know we were done at like two in the afternoon or something it was great okay. and then um 9 11 happened oh <laughs> so I wanted to take my time and find a really sweet teaching gig or mm-hmm. build my own private teaching business and kind of panicked because of that and got a, you know, a bad office job that I won't talk about. And, but then after the, after that job, after I got out of that job, um, that I won't talk about <laughs> and I won't talk <laughs> about how I got out of that job. Um, okay. I got another gig um, teaching just piano lessons to small classes of kids. Okay. I did that for a couple of years. And then I got a, a job teaching elementary school music, which was a, was a pretty sweet gig. It was a real job. It was really only part-time, but they also encouraged me to teach private lessons after school at the okay. school. So all my, my living was entirely in that building. Mm-hmm. And um, it, was, it was a you know, really cool little private school in Bellevue. Um, pretty, pretty affluent, um, but really cool families, pretty diverse, um, pretty techie, the, the families, 
Um, but um, you've just described Bellevue. Yep. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um, it was. It was it was different, uh, kind of a different demographic than it is now. Um, okay. You know, it's just it's gotten even more diverse, more families from from China and, in, and India. Mm-hmm. Um, I still work with some of those families, so it's really okay. great. It's kept my feet on the ground. Were you doing any? Were you performing during this period? Yeah. So playing with Toby's band some of that time. Okay. Also, got my own. Um, I, I formed and recorded my first Birds May Bite album. So Birds May Bite is the name of my own project for songwriting. And let's just stop you. <laughs> How did you come up with the name? It was a sign at the zoo, Woodland, Woodland Park Zoo. And I think it's still there. People send me pictures of it sometimes. It's like, oh, look, <laughs> Birds May Bite. And I think it's just basically, you know, you know, like if you stick your finger in this cage... They will bite you, and it's not our fault, idiot. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm sorry. I was expecting some other complete story, but that's amazing. You know, I got it from the side at the zoo. Perfect. I love it. Okay, it's got a little alliteration in it. I just thought it was. A oh my gosh. Cool name. Okay. All right. So birds may bite. All right. Let's continue. Sorry. For <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I. That's uh yeah a whole other story, but I made four birds may bite records now. Okay. And they've changed, you know, they will, you know, it started out, I worked with a producer uh, named Dan the first time and we spent a lot of time together and we had just different musicians come in, but I think 25 different people played on that record, wow. including okay. Dan and myself and, uh, and really fun. The next one I made almost entirely by myself with my laptop. Um, a couple friends played on it but mostly, mostly just me mm-hmm. and building, you know, basically taking what I learned in music school about orchestration and about, you know, giving different instruments things to do and musical textures and how to double something and make this sound, you know, two instruments as one playing the same line, you get kind of this third instrument that didn't really exist before. Um, just little, little tricks of how to make music. Um, okay. so doing them just by myself in my room, you know, like with the banjo, the accordion, the guitars, um, some borrowed drum stuff, mm-hmm. a tambourine, a shaker, uh, a keyboard. So since this is an audio format, no one can see I'm kind of smirking. <laughs> I, the technology has, has evolved so drastically yeah from when we were in college and i'm older than you so technology you you had more tech when you were in college than i had but we're not splicing tape anymore we're not we're not going into a studio rolling tape spending by the minute for studio time yeah you're now carrying around your laptop in your backpack and it's your recording studio with sampled sounds from any instrument you ever wanted. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. It is amazing. To me. Yeah. To me too. But has it, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, but has it changed the art of creating music in a good way or in a negative way? That's a, that's a great question. It's funny. I'm, I, I think you could argue either way. Oh yeah. I think so too. Um, Funny, I just kind of in the wake of watching the the big uh, Get Back the Beatles documentary. I haven't watched that yet. Yeah, don't tell me anymore. I, I don't want to know. Yeah, but anyway, I mean, they broke up, right? They broke up, isn't that? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I heard that. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's kind of obscure information. It's difficult yeah, to know. Just, uh, yeah. Um, and some of them might not even be alive anymore. But I'm not even sure of that. You know, I mean, you, all these things you read on the internet, and like who's who's alive? Well, I can dead, remember. You know, I can remember. I was in my dorm room. When John Lennon was killed. Oh, wow. And it was bizarre how silent the entire building went. Yeah. It was very, very weird. Yeah. Um, anyway. I mean, You were watching. The same moment. I heard it from Howard Cosell watching Monday Night Football with, with my mom. <laughs> wow. Okay. And I was yeah. like, who's John Lennon? Like, I was 
12. Like I didn't, I just. What? And you didn't know John Lennon at 12? I know. I knew, I knew people who had so, who had marinated in Beatles music and been in, you know, the, the, the bands that were directly influenced by all that mm-hmm. music were some of my favorite things. And I just didn't, I didn't really, I had heard of the Beatles and I knew their instrumental schmaltzy instrumental versions of their songs from my mom's elevator music station. But okay. I didn't really know the, I didn't know the Beatles. It's embarrassing. Okay. All right. Anyway. So we were talking about something else, which was, what, Oh, the process. Tech, yeah. The yeah. process. So, you know, I think, so d- the reason, I, the only reason I brought that up is just, do you see they're basically, you know, they're, they have to, they have to all nail the take, mm-hmm. you know, so you get the spontaneity and you get the imperfection and you get the real music making mm-hmm. and you get people who have been doing it that way. Uh, whereas nowadays, you know, like you can, you can not even be able to play an instrument and make some pretty cool tracks if you know what you want and, and you can make, and you're able to make a decision because they're really, it's, it's <laughs> overwhelming, you know? So this decisiveness is a, is a big helper for anyone doing it. Um, mm. But he, yeah, I mean, I think something is, something is gained, something is lost for sure. Um, That's actually uh, the fact that you said decisiveness, that is actually um, very astute because I think, when given a seemingly never ending variety of options, yeah, uh, paralysis is almost always a byproduct. Yeah. Well, I could do this. I could do that. Uh, I don't do anything versus yeah. getting creative with, you know, spicing tape with a, with an exacto blade and taping it back together. You know, uh, I, I watched, a, yep. a, I watched a show on the Beatles recording in Abbey road and, uh, it was, which at the time was a very, um, sophisticated studio. For sure. Yeah. And the physical gymnastics that they had to go through to slice everything together. Yes. You now can do with a click of a mouse or a touchpad on your laptop. Yeah. And it's, if you're yeah. not sure of what you're doing, if you're taking a risk, you can like, oh, I'll save as... <laughs> this yeah. song name experiment, you know, right? No, that's yeah. And so, you don't lose a thing if you screw it all up. It's like, oh, yeah. I'll go back to the other one because <laughs> I lost right. the I lost the saxophone track. <laughs> did you when you were at Cornish? Did you have? Did, were you using computers much then, or was you know? It was not not t- t- well. Okay, so not nearly as much, but mm-hmm. the notation. I I, I had notation software. So okay. that orchestral piece, going back to that, I did mm-hmm. not have to write that out by hand. Okay. Like I wrote my first semester, I wrote a string quartet by hand, and which means writing out the score for all four musicians and then mm-hmm. writing a part for each musician. So copying violin one's part to a separate piece of paper for just violin one to read. Same with violin two, same with the cello, same with, um, right? So the viola, um, and that's miserable to me that all that writing, it's like, this isn't, I didn't sign up for calligraphy. Like, so I, (laughs) I got me a Mac and I, like, I, I met someone who turned me on to some really, some good software that was pretty user friendly. Cause I wasn't really Mm -hmm. much of a, a tech person. I wasn't okay. super great, but you figured out how to turn on the cassette deck, so that's how you got into Cornish. Exactly. Well, I was used to <laughs> good old, good old stereos growing up. Okay. You know, uh, what was I talking about? Um, well, a tech, the the user friendly tech. Yeah, somebody turned you on. Yeah, yeah. So I got notation software to do that, and also in the in the studio at Cornish, they did they did have a studio, and they did have. Um, basic. I don't know if it was. I don't think it was Pro Tools, but Basic. They did have basic software that mm-hmm. we learned a little bit about how to use, but it, I was really not, not with it yet. But most of what we okay. did was good old, good old razor blade and tape at that point. And actually maybe, I think we, we may have used the computer just to record, like we would do tricks with the tape. We, you know, turn the tape backwards, make a tape loop, literal tape mm-hmm. loop, you know, 
from the heads of the uh, the tape machine, you know, mm-hmm. out a couple feet, use a mic stand f- to hold it from going on the ground, and but but razor blade editing. So we learned a lot of that stuff, right? Also, but then also we would use you know synths and whatnot. But I think we would end up capturing the signal onto. Um, Pro Tools or what, whatever it was they were using whatever on the computer. Was then, yeah. So okay. a little bit of that, but I was it was just basic, really basic. Right. My uh, one year of college, both of my roommates were, in fact, um, the roommate that I'm referring to, well, one of the roommates is the guy who'll be the producer of the show. So Todd um, was, you know, compo- he was trying to be not trying to be but he was composing stuff and i just remember you know handwritten sheets around the house and yeah you like calligraphy you're right that's what it reminded me of the and the other roommate was uh um <laughs> oh we won't talk about the other roommate he's he's been on the show a few times uh, <laughs> i guess he got to speak for himself he he spoke for himself and, and just go back and listen to the wands episodes um michael wansley from the song saying uh thrift shop with Macklemore. That was my college roommate. <laughs> um, oh, okay. we had an interesting, we had an interesting college experience. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. We had, we had a very interesting. So the year that uh, Mike Wansley and Todd and I were roommates. Uh, so Todd was into classical and, and opera. Mike was into jazz and funk and R and B. And, and I was into you know cheap trick and punk rock. Cool. There was only one album that we could agree on that we could play at any one time with all three of us in the room. There, and that was Toto Four. Uh, the rest of the time, the rest of the time, only two people could occupy the house at one time and agree on music. It was a, and we had a massive between the three of us. It was a, a, a very interesting household. Um, uh, it was a very very interesting year. Uh, a lot of fun. I get it. And, yeah, those those. Yeah. There's nothing like those days, right? Yeah, and I still to this day, whenever I hear, you know something off the Toto 4, I just kind of go, Ugh. Is that, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's fun. That's yeah. an interesting agree, uh, point to, of yeah. agreement. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was really fun. Cause two out of three, we could, we could all agree on, you know, two of us could always agree on something, but it was getting that third person to sign off on something. That was the only, the only album that we could agree on. Toto 4. Wow. Mm-hmm. How does that yeah, hold so. up? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it was a, yeah, it's a, it holds up. What's cool is you put on something like that though. And it's really more about sometimes more about the memories that it just like every, every, oh, it, yeah. Yeah. They, they all come rushing back good, good. And like ones that you wanted to forget forever come rushing back. Yeah. You know, ah. But no, that's a, uh, but I just remember Todd, especially, you know, writing out music parts all the time. Yeah. And I think if nothing else, the computer's, made that easier for people so much you know? easier yeah. yeah i mean i can i am not musically inclined i can play you know i can play i used to be able to play a stereo now i can just play spotify um <laughs> get it but i you know i could even sit down with garage band and make something come together that's not yeah good but it won't make you claw your ears out yeah you know just free software on your mac is i know right incredibly powerful I know, and and you can make. I've I've heard lots of garage band recordings that are that just sound good. Mm-hmm. It just sounds good, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, let's transition. Let's just like grind the gears here, and let's just transition into twenty twenty one, twenty twenty two. What is it? You're are you performing live right now? Any, not like right now, the second, but how's the music scene for you? What are you doing? You know, you yeah, yeah. Uh, What's going on? Answer, uh, you know, not a lot of performing, but last summer was summer 2021 after a long Mm -hmm. hiatus was really fun. Um, you Mm -hmm. know, played some, they were intimate backyard things, you know, sure. Uh, some friends with some property down in kind of by Graham, Washington, Mm -hmm. really close to where Toby lives, but very different set of people. But, Mm -hmm. um, we just had a big shindig out on their property and everybody played and then we all just jammed together. And then, you know, a couple other things like that that were just really fun. Uh, but now I'm just making recordings by myself. So I'm recording another, <laughs> another something. 
Okay. Which I, and you're you're still teaching now though, right? Yeah. So every, Monday through Friday in the afternoons, okay. I teach little kids piano, guitar, ukulele. Piano, guitar, and ukulele. I've got a. I've had a couple accordion students, but uh, do not currently. Okay. How do you? I mean, how do you like teaching kids? I mean, do you find the? Uh, how do I want to? Are they okay? So are these the kids that are being drugged to practice by their parents? Like, come on, Timmy, you've got to learn how to play ukulele. And they're like, okay, mom, okay, dad, great, I'll do it. Like, because that was my mom wanted me to learn piano. Yeah. And I just didn't want to. Yeah. I just didn't. We had a, a we had a baby grand in the house. You know, I'd have to walk all of fifteen feet from my room to the baby grand. To, you know, practicing was no excuse, other than I just didn't want to. Yeah. Did you have so did, are these kids? Did you have are, a teacher? are these kids? Well, my mom for a while, and she I think she hoped that she would inspire this love of the of the instrument to me. Yeah. And, you know, to her credit, she tried and had patience, and I was a precocious young child. It's so hard. Um, but the, so the kids you're teaching are they reluctant? Or are they are they uh, are they enthusiastic? I think it, it runs the gamut. Um, okay. I think the most typical, if I had to prove to, or, you know, take one typical story is that it's the parents idea and a little gentle nudge and they start and they're maybe not thrilled about it at first, but I think what happens for me is that I, I get, I'm, I'm, I did not ask for this. I did not cultivate this, but I, have an easy rapport with kids. Okay. So they don't mind hanging out with me so much. Um, All right. Some of them practice, some of them don't. And it really depends mm-hmm. on the family. Cause I don't sure. think any six or seven year old just is, you know, just gonna just go to the piano and by themselves. Practice my scales. Yeah. <laughs> and another thing is I don't, I don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay. It's mostly, you know, these, we're working through these books that are pretty basic. And some of the pieces, the early pieces ba- are, are, are basically scales, you know, but they, but uh-huh. they call them rainbow, blah, blah. And they have a pu- <laughs> they have a cool picture there, but basically you're, you're just, you're, you're not doing anything more interesting than a scale, but they give it a little bit, you know, something to grab onto other than you're just doing this mechanical thing. Okay. All right. But, um, you know, and I just throw in just things depending on the kid. I mean, I always do a little bit of improvisation, um, mm-hmm. especially to start with. And then if they, they like it, then we keep going with it. So yeah. just like, you know, the first lesson, it's like I'm going to play a blues thing. Um, you know, we would it used to be we do it side by side and it's been over Zoom for the last year and a half. But, okay. but you know, I'd take I'd go to the low end of the piano and I'd play. I'd play this blues progression, just simple blues, and just tell them, play any black key, it'll sound good. Let's go. But, but, duh, 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 duh. And it's just fun and it sounds, it sounds decent and it's easy. And they, you know, some of, some of them just catch fire with doing stuff like that right away. Okay. And others are just like, well, okay. But then they, you know, some of the, the other ones that don't take to that, they are just like born to read music and they just like take off and, you know, they just make that connection, which I don't think I was, would have been one of those kids anyway. Like I, I was, okay. I'm just not a natural at reading music. So it, it took me a long time to, to, to where, to get to where I am now, which is, you know, I can do it. You can do it. Okay. How do you like teaching with zoom or over the internet? You know, not to give zoom all the credit, maybe you use a different tool, but you know, we call it Zoom. Yeah, you know. yeah, generically, right? Kleenex, you know, the Kleenex. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the chapstick. Um, you know, it's 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 fine for especially students I already have known. Mm-hmm. I have a rapport with them. I get how they tick, and mm-hmm. and they already have like the basic mechanics of the technique down. So we're not focusing so much on that. I can I can really just listen to them. And no, it's like, oh, you need to do this. You need to do this. You know, instead of like, 
really paying attention to how curved their fingers are and all that stuff. Okay. But you know, with, with beginner students or students who are, I'm less familiar with, it's just really hard. Okay. Yeah. I won't miss it. So are you, are you doing this through, uh, through a school or are you, is this a, a, your own private business now or? Yeah, it's my own both, private or, business. Or, so, because we always like to, you know, give a shout out, where can people find out more about it? You know what? Um, I don't have a website what? because I always got my business through this school, right? Okay. And All I right. still do to a certain extent. Okay. Um, how about a phone number? Is there a phone number? <laughs> we could we could link it at the bottom. I mean, yeah, you know, I have an email address. In okay, perfect. We'll share that at the bottom. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, of course. Uh, you know, because if, if somebody's got a kid that's looking for, you know, they're looking for instruction, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I want to ask you a couple of questions that aren't, they're kind of, well, now we'll go back. You already talked about a bad gig. And that, luckily for us, was out of the state of Washington, so we're not talking yeah. bad about Washington. <laughs> Didn't count. Didn't happen. So, as as a as a musician, have there been any venues that you really enjoyed performing at? Yeah, you know, I, I I've listened to some of your other shows, so I know okay. that this is a question that comes up from time to time. Well, pretty much every episode, and I <laughs> I actually like kind of made a, a list in my mind okay. of there there a, a lot okay. um mostly the ones that i've had the most experience with are in seattle um okay. and i've had good experiences elsewhere but like places like cafe racer so on the okay so a kind of different scale so places like um the parliament tavern now defunct west seattle it, Sorry, the Parliament now defunct. It, it, yeah, I mean, it was it was Sorry. called the Shipwreck, and then it was called oh. the Parliament Tavern in West Seattle. Do you remember? Okay, I, I remember the ship, the ship, not the Parliament. I don't remember that. But. Yeah. Okay. All right. Not there anymore. But but basically, a little pub. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a sound guy who paid enough attention, who was right. pretty good. Not the best system, but. A nice little place and kind of intimate, so you the people you could get hecklers, and okay. and it was it was like that. And All right. I like a consistent thing for me is I I really like those kind of gigs because often I'm performing solo these days. Sure, and I like having that kind of interface that you get the and right. you get a lot of energy back. It's mm-hmm. not like you're sitting there and you're you know the the worst case scenario. You're under a lot of lights. You can't see anybody and you can't hear anybody and you just right. don't get that, the connection of, of that. You don't get that connection. Right. <laughs> That's all. So I like places like that cafe racer who are now in a new location on Capitol Hill. They used to be in Ravenna right by the trading mm-hmm. position. Um, funky place. The sound yeah. always funky, always Barely duct taped together and probably won't work at first go. Someone will have to problem solve it. And more likely than not, the person, and this is before, probably Mm -hmm. they, I think, I bet you they have a better situation now because they've got a more plush location. Haven't been there yet. But traditionally, I still loved playing there, even though it was so janky. Most often the person (laughs) there who was the person who would, you would think would run sound was also like, serving drinks and cooking, you know, like doing all of that. So <laughs> you're, you're lucky if you get any, any, any help, what, depending on how, okay. how good business is. Okay. But I love the vibe of places like that, you know? All right. So there are the places like that. And then on the, as you move up the scale, places like the crocodile and the tractor and the Royal room, Columbia city theater, Oh, really yeah. great places to play with mm-hmm. staff that are awesome. Always competent sound people. Um, I think in all cases, all of those cases, a, a green room, like, you know, <laughs> you know, a lot of places. That tractor, the tractor's green room was not all that impressive. <laughs> no, but it was a green room. <laughs> it was a green room. Yeah. But, you know, 
it just like places that that really run a, a tight ship and and it was going to sound good for the folks that came and you were going to get right. good sound on stage you know you right. could say more of this and less of that in the monitor and they would would be able to to execute that right i've always enjoyed the tractor yeah as a as a as a as an audience member yeah they make it sound I've good. always yeah. i've always enjoyed the tractor tavern yeah. so so on that note as a as a as a listener of music where what venues have you found that you've enjoyed to go see performers at? Um, all of those places. Um, yeah. But, you know, also, like, you know, the Triple Door. <sighs> I mean, what a... I swear, I swear, I'm gonna, that every guest must be paid by the Triple Door. Because I keep it... I'm going to actually go back and listen through the music episodes and, and, and jot these down. I'm going to... I'm seriously going to... At least eighty percent of you, yeah, have mentioned the triple door. Yeah, it's so, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I, I just, it's so funny to me. The triple door, the triple door. Well, have you ever had a bad the time tri- at the triple door? No, I have not. <laughs> so it's just, but it's just funny to me. It's always the triple door. It is a great okay. place, but you know, I, I thought of one. Uh, listening to a previous episode reminded me. Okay, the backstage. I loved the backstage. Um, listening, what Ed Beeson was his name, is yeah. his name. Um, yeah, is his name. I love that yeah. conversation because I same thing. Like, it was like those that where that in the where bands are in the food chain was mm-hmm. exactly you know probably you know three nights out of every week I could have gone there because it was a band that I was mm-hmm. interested in, whether local right. or national act mm-hmm. or international. You know, I saw. Evo Papasov, uh, Bulgarian wedding music, like, yeah, they booked, you know, they, I saw all kinds of stuff there. They, yeah. They, they did a really nice job booking there. Yeah. And it's always a venue that I can never remember the name of it. I can never like, what's the name of that place in Ballard? You know, yeah. And it's, it's so funny. I was like, uh, the backstage, but yeah, no, that was a, that was a fun venue. Um, I do have one more. Okay. And well, this partly is just the the product of that this particular moment. Like the summer, of, I believe it was summer of '89. I was still in college. We were living in Pullman that summer, and mm-hmm. somebody had the great idea to let's go see Stevie Ray Vaughan at the Gorge or this place called the Gorge because nobody had heard of the Gorge yet. I think it may have been it was early days, early days of the Gorge. And um, so we went and we camped out, and it was amazing. And like at this time, like they had this little, you know, they had all the the same kind of terrain, but they had this Mm -hmm. little ribbon around the elite area right in front of the stage and these little flimsy chairs up there for the people that paid a lot more than we did to get in. And, Mm -hmm. and, and and then also they sold, you, you couldn't bring in your own booze as I recall, but they would sell you a bottle of wine. Yep. So I think we were all carrying around our own bottle of wine. Yep. Yep. And hijinks ensue. And as the show yep. goes on, that little that little uh, ribbon around the elite area disappeared, and we found ourselves like basically getting sweated on by Stevie Ray Vaughan. And yeah. um, I'm so glad I saw that because I wouldn't have had another chance. I mean, maybe he did it the next year, but that's the one I saw, and I'm so glad I saw it. That is, for me, I, I've seen a lot of shows at the Gorge through the years. I think I've figured out over 50 shows at the Gorge. Wow. And um, a lesson I learned not as early as I should have, um, September at the Gorge, bring a blanket because it gets cold. Yeah. Um, yeah, I made the mistake of showing up to a, I went and saw the wallflowers and counting crows wearing shorts and a t-shirt in September. Oh. And I was 85 in the, in the afternoon and I was driving over from the saddle area. I'm like, Oh, it's hot. It's 85. Yeah. It gets, it gets chilly once the sun goes oh, down. At the gorge. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Now the gorge, we're lucky to have that venue. How about Spokane? Um, anything, anything in the Spokane uh, market that you uh, enjoy playing at or have you seen music at? Cause that's, that's. No, I've only been to two venues in Spokane. You know, one I can speak highly of, one I don't care about. Um, there are good places. It's funny, like I grew up there. Um, mm-hmm. you know, when I was a kid, what you know, the Coliseum 
is it isn't there anymore it sounded like crap but that's what we did you know to see big rock concerts before we were 21. well i think the coliseum's still there because i saw bob seger there a couple well, they of years got an, ago a re, it, they built a new place yeah and it was i mean we saw bob seger there because <laughs> well you know it, um, it's hollywood nights yeah well it was kind of like you know let's go see him he's not going to be touring forever it was his last tour yeah and, and the, ven- the venue was fine, but it was just, it was like the Seattle center. It's just like, I just don't like venues like that. Yeah. I don't. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, I like, I like a good club show where you get a yeah. lot of real energy and vibe and you can move around and yeah. So the, have you, ever, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Did you ever go to the first interstate? Uh, it's, it's about a 2,500 seat uh, arena across the street from one of the Davenport theaters. First interstate, yeah. First interstate center. Uh huh. That's in Spokane. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, know that. Yeah, it's like a. It it holds like maybe twenty five hundred three three thousand people, and um, yeah, it's a great it's a great venue. I mean, I'm a tall big guy, yeah. and I can sit in the seats, and my knees don't hit the seat in front of me, so that's a win. Like that's like really a win for me. Um, yeah, we've seen um. A couple shows there, nice venue. So is it is it kind of like a theater? Kind of, yeah. It's a theater, but it's 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 like the Paramount without all the glitz. More more upscale than the more less less upscale than the Paramount. So less chandeliers and stuff like that. Less less chandeliers, um, better seating because they're bigger seats. I mean, they're yeah, you know, you know, kind of nice. Cool. It's funny I haven't heard of it, but I wonder if it's. You know, it's 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 a finite place. So I'm thinking that it's one of the old movie theaters that they moved over. And I no no, you think no, it's, it's bigger. It's it's bigger than that. And it was probably called something. It was there for the the World's Fair. Okay. And so it's it's been renamed. I mean, First Interstate's sponsor, you know, got their name on the door now because they wrote a big check. You know, whatever it was called. Yeah, before. yeah. So I probably know it if you if you yeah. knew the name of it before. I, that's what I know it as. Yeah. So, so, all right. Um, uh, so other stock questions I typically ask is a uh, coffee fan. Are you a coffee oh, fan? Much so. Very much so. Okay. So, um, what do you recommend for coffee in, in your, in your neighborhood, neck of the woods? I have got just the place. Um, it's called CNP coffee. I've not heard of this one. It's, it's coolest little place. So it's kind of on, I'm, I'm in West Seattle and okay. it's in the same block, but, um, toward the water further west by about a mile Mm -hmm. it's on california Mm -hmm. avenue it's it's an old house beautiful big old house that this couple started uh serving coffee in this beautiful big old house like probably early 2000s like i lived right by there so it was around the corner from our house and just a cool vibe they have live music there sometimes great coffee um and since COVID, they put a lot of energy and time and money into making the outdoor area really nice also. So they've got the backyard. Okay. They've got this side area with tables um, and covers. And they they just, it's so sweet. So where on California? Um, 5,600 block of California. Um, Give me a landmark because it's, I'm, I'm, it's been a long time since I was on California. Well, let's see. So that the junction, the, the junction with Easy yeah. Street and all that, it's yeah. about half a mile south of that. And there's a Thriftway at at yeah, Morgan. At Morgan. And it's in Morgan. It's maybe a couple blocks north of that. So it's kind of between the the Thriftway and the oh. Easy Street. Um, there are a couple oh. uh, marijuana stores right by there also that I remember. Um, and other businesses too. I, I'm still drawing a blank. Webster's cafe used to be kind of in that area back in a long time ago. Oh, I don't know huh. that. I'll I mean, it, it could be that it's close not to there. that. So or, it's a, yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. The letters C and P Cameron and Pete, the people's name. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Friendly. Good place. Okay. So birds may bite. Where can people hear hear your music? You can hear birds may bite. Thank you for asking. Um, like all the normal places, the Spotify, the Amazon Music, stuff like that. All, all four mm-hmm. albums are up there. Um, cool. But what's better for the artist 
always better for the artist is the band camp. Mm-hmm. Now I only have one album up there, actually two up there so far. I'll put the other ones up there eventually, but basically the, the new one, the new one is on any platform. It's called birds may bite you. So you is the album title. <laughs> I always put some cute, like, birds may bite if startled. Birds may bite. If startled. Bees may not. <laughs> it's always an album title like I that. I love it. I love um, it. I love that. Okay. But, uh, Bandcamp, birds. look up Birds May Bite, and you'll find it. And, um, okay. yeah, you can listen. You can still listen. for. You can still stream it on Bandcamp and, and okay. without, you know, like, you know, check it out. See if you like it. If you like it, you know, throw me a few bones and. Own it for life. Yeah, support. We got to support music. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We got to keep supporting the arts. Yeah. Then the, to wrap this up, I always lately. This is my uh, to be full disclosure to you, the guest, and to you, the listeners. This is where Scott. It, well, which Scott? Yeah. This episode, but, <laughs> we'll um, see. Me, uh, me. Um, basically admits that he might not have done all his homework. So, <laughs> what didn't I ask you that I should have? <laughs> um. Well, I'm not sure. Like, you know, there are a number of things you should have asked me and I'm so, oh, and I'm go. so glad you didn't. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. Well, then we won't. <laughs> what was, you know, like, what was, what was the girlfriend's name that bloody, bloody, blah. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Nah. No, um, this is, I mean, it's one, this is one of those conversations that I find, um, very easy, um, and really and fun. Like if I met you somewhere, it, it would be really fun to continue the conversation and learn more. Yeah. I'd learn, I'd want to learn more about the heats to start with. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get Steve on one of these days. Uh, yeah. Uh, part of me doing the, the music thing was I thought I would, uh, uh, and uh, in full, full disclosure in, cause I know Steve won't listen to this. Lu- Lucette might, but Steve won't. So Lucette, if you hear this, don't, don't tell Steve. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, when we started this, we we're just doing one episode a week and then, uh, January of, of this year. So we're just about up to a year now. I thought, well, let's, let's, let's add musicians in. Cause I want to talk to Steve. I want to sit down with Steve and ask him all these questions about the 40 years that I've known him yeah. as, as a musician, uh, you know, and, and go through that. And yeah, I still haven't had him on. Uh, it just, it just, it just hasn't worked out. Um, and I think, for me to record with Steve will probably be in person. I want to do it. I want to do that one in person and sit down with him cool. and, and, and uh, probably end up being more than one episode if, if I get my way. Um, but Steve Pearson has uh, been a disproportionate influence on my, on my music consumption through the years uh, of local, of local music. You know, he through people he has played with is he's introduced me to lots of other great local musicians, musicians that I listen to that I probably would not have heard of is uh, he in, without Steve. Is he in Seattle? They've, uh, they moved to Arizona. Oh, okay. So they moved to Arizona. They, uh, <laughs> the reason, not the reason, but a reason that, that we moved over here was uh, Steve's band was playing over in, in Cleolum uh-huh. and my wife, we had been talking about moving. And we were trying to figure out like where we're in the state. We, I wanted to get away from the traffic. Yeah. And uh, my wife was talking to some, some so we went over to, we drove over to Cleom to see Steve's band play. And um, my wife was talking to some people in the audience and they're like, well, you should move to Wenatchee. You know, Steve and Lisette just live up the road and you know, blah, blah, blah. And so my wife goes, Hey, what do you want to look at Wenatchee? And I'm like, sure. I don't know. I think about Wenatchee. And uh, four months later we bought a house here. <laughs> Awesome. And so, you know, they, they live, Steve and Lucette were living kind of up in the Pashastan area. I had to learn how to say that word. That was kind of the joke. And then uh, they, they sold their house last year and moved down to Arizona to avoid winter. Um, ah. But yeah, yeah. So the, the heats were a yeah, disproportionate uh, part of my musical uh, repertoire. That's cool. You just, yeah, you, that's been one of those, you know, places in my mind that I haven't thought of for a long time. Yeah. But I'm now I'm going to find some heats that, and listen to them today. Yeah. I mean, Steve. Yeah. So not that we want to give Steve Pearson too much credit on your episode, but he also, <laughs> uh, he's recorded, uh, you know, he had another band called the range hoods. Okay. Uh, and then Steve Pearson and British racing green, 
was his was his band, and then he record you know does a lot of stuff just under Steve Pearson. Cool. Um, yeah, he's yeah he's been fairly prolific through the years. I'm gonna look him up. So there you go. Well, I am gonna let you go so that you can uh, you probably have students to teach, and and who knows maybe you'll train them to be a guest on an upcoming episode. Maybe we'll, you know, who knows, who knows who you're working with. I'm going to dangle that in front of them. (laughs) That'd be kind of funny. Okay. If you practice your scales, you can go talk to Scott. (laughs) Yeah. And and you wonder why no, no, no students will ever show up to your gigs. (laughs) Anyway. um, But thank you so much for making this happen. And, uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, but you kind of dodged it. Is there something I should have asked you that I didn't that you want to talk about? I, I mean, I could, you know, I could, I could bore you and everyone else for hours talking about process of recording and songwriting and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, I mean, songwriting process. I, I mean, I, I've got, I, I, I think I could make it elevator size pitch about songwriting. Okay. That, you know, I actually, when you run into people at parties, you know, what do you do? What, what are you into? And it's like, oh, and you, and you, you inevitably get some version of, Oh, I would really like to do that, but I'm not blah de blah, or <laughs> I didn't get the chance to blah de blah, or whatever, you know. <laughs> or you know, I would like to. How would you suggest I get started? And I, I would do something like this and say, you know, the the key to writing great songs is to write a lot of songs. Um, I heard that from I think I think Nancy Wilson said it in some interview a long time ago, and it just Probably. stuck, you know. So basically mm-hmm. what I like to do, and I have a group of friends who do this too, is write, a, like, well, what we used to do was we'd take a, a day, a sun, Saturday or Sunday, where we wouldn't have to do anything mm-hmm. else and try to write songs all day going for quantity, not quality. Okay. And inevitably, some some things, you know, like break down in your critical mind and you start just getting freer and freer. And you you inevitably write some horrible songs, but, but. <laughs> occasionally but. you write some gems too, and you you kind of just learn you exercise the muscle of the process of doing this thing, you know. Okay. So I suggest write lots of songs, maybe do something like that, make a pact with some friends, and just write songs and then share with them. That's the that's the be- that's the payoff is because then you get right. to share your your triumphs and uh, tribulations and you know and inevitably it's like oh my computer broke and i couldn't do this so i ended up doing that and all the things that happen it's just it's just fun you hang out together and you share and oh that's a great idea actually i mean and and i think that this applies not just to songwriting it's it applies probably to a lot of creative endeavors is how do you how do you paint a great piece well by painting a lot of really bad ones how do you write a great song by writing a lot of really bad ones no none of us are perfect no and one question i didn't ask you and for time's sake i won't i'll I'll say it but we won't necessarily go down that route like what mistakes i mean we learn from those mistakes so you you know you had this great idea this would be great and you go "Ooh, that was really bad that didn't work but i took this whatever this musical this chord structure i can use this here oh this was the key yes and that's we have to be okay with um letting things breathe and ultimately fail i mean we have to take feedback and criticism you have to be pretty thick skin yeah you know the beauty back to the technology thing the beauty of this day and age is that you can make mistakes with very few consequences you know right and you can save save everything yeah and hard drives are cheap yep exactly just fill yeah. that thing up and oh yeah, hard, and name your things appropriately so that you can figure out what they are later that's <laughs> maybe the, worth the price of admission exactly. right exactly yeah, clear naming structure all right well scott thank you so much for being on here i i had a lot of fun this was uh um this is, uh, you know, selfishly for me, these are always fun. So that's, that's kind of cool. Uh, look forward to checking out some of the birds may bite you. That's actually just brilliant. I love that. And uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Scott. It was a real pleasure.
Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.